This comes to you with huge thanks to our show sponsor, Resi. Resi is the UK's leading architectural platform, bringing together everything that you need to design, build and finance your dream project. Whether you're looking to extend, renovate or even build from scratch, book a free consultation at resi.co.uk. Hello everyone, great to have you with us. This is season four, episode three of the Move IQ Property Podcasts. Um, thank you for tuning in. This time we're going to be talking about inspiring home improvement ideas and dealing with building works on a budget. It's another big old wide topic, so I'm really pleased to be joined by Nick Stockley. Nick, how on earth do people decide, especially when they're, um, they're working to a set and a tight budget, on what improvement works to make? Um, it, 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 there are... <laughs> The, the do's and the don'ts, there's so much to consider. What what do they start with, do you think? What's what's the jumping off point? Yeah, hi Phil. Yeah, yeah, definitely help with this. I think um quite used to dealing with these type of scenarios really. Um, I think I think the first thing we would look at really or, or a homeowner should look at is what is their existing space and how can that be adapted to improve the design function, um, whatever, whatever they want to kind of achieve really is, is the end kind of goal. Um, generally, when you're reusing an existing footprint and, and improving the design, that is what I would classify as something within a budget, basically. So let's say, for example, you've got two separate kind of reception rooms, but you're not using them kind of intertwined. It's quite a broken kind of arrangement. What could we do? We could easily open up the dividing wall. We could put in the lights of, say, sliding pocket doors so they can kind of recess into the actual stud partition. They're not opening into the space, which detracts away from, say, furniture, for example. Mm -hmm. But it gives you that flexibility, that adaptability around how you can reconfigure your floor plan and really change the functionality of, of, of your home environment. So, so it's not actually necessarily creating extra space. It's it's increasing the usability and the functionality of the space that you have. Yeah, definitely. I, I've certainly been um, into into um, into flats that have been developed over the course of time, and 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 you go into one that really works, and it might actually be have a smaller square footage, but feels bigger, and that is because it's been cleverly thought through and cleverly designed, and and the usability of the space is much better because people have removed corridors or taken out hallways and that kind of thing. So it ends up feeling better, and um, which, is a, which is a big win. There are sort of so many variables and, and options of, of home improvements that people can make. And, and I've always said it's not what you've got to spend. It's not the sum of money that you've got to spend. It's where you spend it that, that makes such a difference. Um, can you just expand a bit on on sort of your ideal scenarios where are the, where are the easy wins yeah definitely um i think that obviously we've got the lights of refurbishment of bathrooms mm -hmm. you've got existing kitchens that can be kind of retained and stripped back and repainted and new worktop new handles all of a sudden you've had a three four thousand pound facelift that would cost you twenty thirty thousand pounds in terms of yeah. investment and you're going yeah. to get to enjoy it and, and then someone buy it in the future gets that wow factor. Yeah. You can look at the, the, the rear, the rear elevation of a, a say of a property, which has got like a small pokey window and a door going out into the garden. Um, keep, keep the kind of lintels in situ and, and open it up and put in a set of bifold doors. So you get that visual connection. You yeah. get that kind of indoor outdoor space kind of relationship and you can get daylight flooding into the environment. You've got, roof light opportunities and, and different paint colors and different textures and lots of different things you can do within uh, the existing space. I meet a lot of people who, when they're house hunting, they are very interested in curb appeal and what it looks like from the outside. And whilst we're blessed in this country with some wonderful architecture, there were, there were periods of history that wasn't <laughs> quite so fine. Um, can you make, can you turn an ugly house into a pretty house? I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, yes, <laughs> I think a lot of it will come down to uh, just how much you, you want to spend on it or what your kind of end, end goal is in terms of curb appeal for yourself or future retail. Um, yeah. Some techniques around it are the materials. 
So what materials have you got that you can retain and I know paint over, for example, mm -hmm. it could be, it could be piers. It could be the windows itself. It could be the door being sanded down, stripped back and repainted. It could be some of the landscaping, um, planting. Um, a lot of it will basically be around cost control, which is keeping the structure and applying what you can to it to make it look a lot more attractive. Basically, that's the way I would look at it. Can you do anything with Pebble Dash or is it just a case of painting it? Yeah, I think you, you can. You can take it off um, and, 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 and and apply a render, for example. Uh, but again, that's that's budget driven. No. Um, but the, yeah, the quick fix on that is certainly a, a paint, a liquor of mm. paint, basically. And it can look a lot more attractive a, within a few days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love Huge a lot of paint, yeah. Buckets and buckets <laughs> of paint. Um, I mean, something that Kirsty always talks about is, and, and she does this because she lives in a, in a flat in London that doesn't look very nice from the outside, but it looks out on some really, really beautiful houses. She says, well, I don't stand outside mine looking at it. I stand in my flat looking out at some really, so I don't care what it looks like. And you know, it's a valid point. A few years ago, we had a, um, a, a girl come on, it was a couple, come on the location programme, and she said curb appeal was important, and uh, together with a whole bunch of other things. Arrived at the house that we'd lined up to show them, and she burst into tears and said, and she was really upset, really upset. I told you curb appeal, this is an ugly house, I can't stand it, I don't know why you brought me here, it's hideous. <laughs> and, and, we, and we calmed her down and sort of mopped up the tears and and did eventually persuade us to come into the house and explained why we thought it was a suitable option, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and then started to put a package together of how it, could, how, how it could look very different outside, along the lines of you just explained. Well, anyway, they bought the house. I drove past it about five years later, and they hadn't done it at all. They had done none of the work whatsoever. <laughs> They're obviously happy with their views out then, I suppose. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think um, on that as well, they, that there are there's quite dramatic things you can do. You can reclad, you can apply materials and textures, you need to think about planning. And I think curb appeal is about, I suppose in a way, when you approach your home, do you feel proud proud of yeah. it? And I think yeah. that's what a lot of people tend to do. And also it is important when you I suppose sell because some people can't see beyond that, like like the lady you just su suggested. It's quite easy to improve the facades and mm. and, and, and regenerate it and, and have your own personal touch on it. Mm. Um, but it's just, I suppose, how wide that audience is, really. Yeah. Um, let's just talk a little bit about um, whether home improvements are done for yourself and your personal tastes and habits and likes and dislikes, uh, or whether they're done for resale. And at what point in, in your experience or indeed in the advice that you give your clients at Resi, where to draw the line between what's for you and what's for resale? Yeah, I think we get this... <clears throat> often really and it's i always tend to go down the path of how long do you intend to stay here so if it's a one two year then i would always advise our clients to be sensible around their investment if they want to look at a return and, and not lose money mm. or over over capitalize if they've got a five ten year plan then it's very much more around invest what you're comfortable investing based on personal circumstances because you're going to get to enjoy that for the next five ten years and to be honest it is going to increase the value so it's very much around the individual needs and then we will mm. tailor our advice accordingly really and make mm. sure they're aware of the options available to them. So it's, a, it's an interesting one because there's no right or wrong with these things, no. is there? It's, it's kind of different views and, and, and what's, what, what suits you or what's, what you like, somebody else might not like. It's, it's all subjective. Yeah, 100%. Where, where do you think people go wrong? If they get it wrong, where, where does it tend to happen? Oh, interesting question, that one, Phil. Um, I, I would say that I think you've kind of just touched on it really around what they like versus someone else. Mm. And I think it's about your individual needs. But if you are looking mm. to improve the curb appeal over, say, a, a period of time and you want to enjoy it, plus you want to maximize the value in the future when you sell it or the attractiveness to a wider audience again, I think you've got to get a balance between something that's not too risky and unfortunately, it's not that interesting half the time, but it's around the colours, the textures, the materials that you kind of like, but a lot of other people would also like. Mm. It's like the greys, for example, yeah. that are quite often there's, used. There's an awful lot of grey out there at the moment, isn't there? Oh, yeah, 100%. Every, yeah. Every, everywhere and on everything. Yes. 
Um, I mean, it's something I've often said is you've got to, when you're selling, you want it to appeal to the widest common denominator. You want the greatest number of people. Yeah. So anything with pink walls or, or, or you know your specific taste for your bedroom, whatever it may be, um, may narrow that market. But you can always <laughs> paint it grey. You know, you can you can put things back when it comes to selling to to to, to ensure it. Appeals to the widest number of people. Yeah, uh, something else I guess people should bear in mind is is the price bracket of your fixes and fittings, your your floors or your um, cabinets or your shower tray or what, whatever it may be. The price of your fixes and fittings need to match the price bracket of the property, uh, and I've seen that um, in in the past get spectacularly wrong in both elements. I've seen a really expensive flat with a horrible laminate cheap flooring that ruined it. It just ruined the flat. Yeah. And equally, I've seen a really fairly run-of-the-mill small three-bed terraced house that wasn't worth... I mean, it's probably worth the average. It's probably worth 200 grand. But somebody had gone and put a 35 grand kitchen in it. And you think that that's just, you haven't got, you haven't increased it by 35 grand. You, you've definitely enhanced the value, but not by, you, you've gone over the ceiling price. Um, so it, th there's a lot of sensitivities around that topic, which I guess is um, is, is why it's an interesting one to, to discuss. Um, w w one question um, that I wanted to put to you, uh, on on home improvements and when you're managing the budget tightly, uh, sh should you use um, independent contractors, several of them, the plumber, the chippy, <clears throat> the electrician, or should you go with a bigger company? Because there's kind of rights and wrongs and pros and cons to, to both, aren't there? Yeah, there is. And I think I'll try and simplify the answer for me based on what we we at resi would advise our clients and i think the first defining factor is like the type of project first of all and um, then it's your budget because a small builder will could and will do the same as a medium or a large organization but the medium or larger have got overheads offices vans etc cetera, etc cetera. but they have the benefit of bigger teams mm -hmm. um so and the bigger the team the more expensive it's going to cost basically um some of the value around smaller teams and subcontractors is do they meet the vat threshold because if they don't for example then mm. you're going to get your value in the vat for example yeah um which is obviously all kind of above board um then the other kind mm. of value of the smaller team is that you're probably going to get a much better price overall if mm. you use individuals but what you've got to be careful with there is the management of the individuals, responsibility and accountability. For example, you get a plasterer in, you skim your walls, the decorator comes in and says, I can't paint over that. The walls are terrible. Then the plasterers say, well, the decorator needs to prepare. And the decorator will say, well, I can't paint that. It's not my job. Um, same with flooring or plumbers or electricians. So I think if you are in the industry or understand it, or you can pay for a project manager or contract administrator to support you throughout the build process and prepare your tender packages, whether it's combined or separated, then you can get some value in that. And I think you could go down that route, but you've got to be very mm. careful. <clears throat> I guess a lot of it depends on the size of the job, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if, if the job does involve all of the different trades then lining them up and having availability of the right person on the right day. And it is a lot of coordination it is problem with problems. <laughs> yes. yes. And they do love to blame each other, don't they? 100%, yeah. And you get stuck, <laughs> stuck with it as the client, basically, and get yeah. frustrated. So, yeah. But then there's an added cost if you're going to have a project manager um, to oversee everything or, or, or a bigger company. Yes. Um, how important are budget contingencies? How much should somebody... I mean, things we all know things can take longer and cost more than, than, than you might hope. Um, how much of a contingency would your clients, for instance, hold back? Do you talk about that with your clients? It's, 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 a, it's probably a difficult topic to ra raise with clients before you start work, but it's important. Yeah, I, yeah, I think budget is, is key to any successful journey, and an architect should certainly be talking about it from the outset because you need to manage expectations and make sure budget is a key consideration. And the, the earlier a client understands it, then they can come back to you with, actually, I can increase my budget 
for example, which is great because you've got something you can design, which is more interesting, but it allows the client to dictate and understand their circumstances. I think the key to contingency, I call it kind of the ingoing and outgoing cost, the spread of that and how that happens. And I think that if you follow the right process of architects, drawings, planning, building regulations, structured engineer, drainage survey, compile that package, which is the devil's in the detail. Then you go to the builders and tender for it and you make sure that you know what you're placing the contract against. So it's very clear what the builders are allowing for versus not. <laughs> if you nail that down, then you can come away with a contingency spread of around you know, five, six, seven, up to 10%. If you cut corners in the front and you go to a builder with a set of planning drawings and you don't really go into the detail around what their quote is and isn't included, then you're going to spread it and you're going to spend 15, 20% above what your budget is. And then when mm. you're on site, that's a very dangerous territory for me. So mm. I think it's all about the prep work. It's all about the detail at the front and to, to plan okay. your finances and, and manage your investment, really. Very good advice, Nick. Thank you. If somebody is, um, let's say they're just redoing a bathroom, nothing overly complicated. Yeah. They've got the plumber. Should they, should they allow 5%, 10% just, you know, just to be careful? I think the key, the key thing about ex when you work on existing is when you strip everything back, there's the things you can't see. Yeah. So for example, you take out your tiles and then the flooring's knackered and you want to then put, then you need to prepare back for the tile in and the, mm. the, the, the bathroom team have only allowed for installing new tiles that you're going to buy. Yeah. It's the same with stripping back the walls. What you might strip it back and there's a crack or the, the plaster's blown for example. Yeah. So again, there, sh uh, there should always be a contingency. Mm. A good way of getting aw away with this is kind of stripping out everything before you agree on a price, but that's more time okay. consuming. Yeah. So that's another technique that could be used. A, um, a kind of saying that um, I've always stuck with me is you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and yes. when you start building works, you, yeah, you don't know where it's going to end. But it, it is challenging, but it is also satisfying and, and, and really fulfilling when, it, when you get it right. But Nick, as always, terrific advice, really, really useful. No um, thank you so much. 